Thank you, Kamara. Good morning. Welcome, welcome to Business Garage. There are people here I left at a party last night. And they've been going party after party after party. And I found them here. So, I don't know. Uh, bless you guys. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Uh, Bright Life team, thank you for coming. We are few but powerful at Business Garage. Yeah, so you might be thinking, hey, so I'll find a thousand people here. No, one of us can put a thousand to flight. And two of us can send the legions fleeing. What I like about Business Garage, you know, like even in business class, you know, like on the airplane, there are not too many seats in business class. <laughs> Most of the seats are in economy. You know, the other services, this place feels that people can hardly fit here, except the business garage, where you only have the few people who uh, understand that if you don't win the economic mountain, you can pray your knees sore for nothing. The real difference we are going to make in the kingdom is going to include majorly, if not, uh, a financial mountain. So. We are dealing with this, so I want to thank you so much for being here. Uh, we are going to take a break in December because December is rest month in worship harvest. And so we only do very basic things. The only thing we do during December are the main services. And even then, the last Sunday, we don't even have a service. So uh, because we want to give all the teams an opportunity to just, you know, recuperate, rest, and only show up on Sunday. They don't even rehearse. They only do music which they already know. So, please, next Sunday and the other Sunday, don't come here at 7, except if you want to have personal prayer time. From next Sunday until January. Yeah. If you come at that time, there will be lots of room to pray by yourself. But we will not be here to facilitate your learning. Amen? And then next Sunday, for those of you who are part of the other services, we have a special Thanksgiving service. Uh, first December um, because we want to recognize what God has done in, in, the, in the year and it's going to be exciting. Awesome. Those who are watching us online, thanks for joining us and I want to celebrate the media team Matan, Parsis, Paula uh, and all those who have made sure that we have because we have a lot of engagement online with the business garage because a lot of our friends are still negotiating with a blanket at this time. So thank you so much. And I would also like to appreciate the team that has uh, made this possible throughout, from when we started in July. It was a dream. We just said, let's start and see what happens. So Kamara, yeah, come on. Let's celebrate this business apostle, Kamara. Chris Kawesa. Yeah, if you're watching us, Chris is not here. Uh, uh, his grandmom passed on, and so he's very engaged with the family. That's why he's not here on this last day of Business Garage 2019. Evelyn, yeah. Yes. Meanwhile, Chris, Kamara, and Evelyn, I don't know how they all conspired. I think they've each lost like 15 kilograms in the last three months, courtesy of the services of Coach Berry over here. Uh, Evelyn, do you want to stand up briefly? Just, just for just. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 Jesus. Yeah. Stuart! Stuart! Bishop Stuart! Thank you so, so much for making sure we have uh, our worship team every Sunday at 7. Uh, worship team guys, thank you so much for making it possible. Awesome. Who have I left out? Which team? Tech team, of course. Yeah, JB. Yay. Yay. And Michael, the lights, and uh, oh. Oh. Dennis Amoko. Dennis. Where is Dennis? And the, yeah, the guest experience team, Julia, Sarah. Thank you, thank you so much for making Business Garage possible. As we do this last Sunday of Business Garage, we'd also like to appreciate the businesses that featured in this season. Thank you so much for coming to 
inspire us to showcase what you're doing. I'm telling you, this thing is only going to get better. Yeah, one time there will be a thousand billionaires seated in that auditorium downstairs <laughs> for business garage, thinking about how to turn this whole thing into a reality. And it's going to happen. Yeah. It's going to happen. Kano Kalango, uh, those who go to worship Harvest Bugolobi downtown, Katikati, I'll be there this morning, all those locations. So. Don't ask how it's going to happen. Just let me see you there. Bugolobi, 9 o'clock. Downtown, 10 o'clock. Katikati, 11.15. Yes. Nalia, you're going to have the apostle of business. Noah Balesamfu. Taking it down. So, invite your friends. All right. Oh, switch on. Huh. So, this is where we've been. We've been... Uh, really? Uh, okay. Okay. We've been, in, in these last Sundays, we've been looking at this idea of production, multiplication, and dominion, right? Genesis 128. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful. That's stage one. Fruitfulness. And multiply, stage two. Fill the earth, subdue it. That's stage three, which is dominion over creation. Dominion over creation. As long as man is under the circumstances, we don't yet have dominion. Have you, have you had that statement? Under the circumstances? No, you're not supposed to be under the circumstances. As long as we are depending on rain patterns for agricultural success, we don't yet have dominion. Because there are people who produce a lot of food stuff without rain. Uh, I don't know. Uh, people here, <laughs> as long as we are still being ruled by nature, we don't yet have dominion. But we are here to say we need to change the Story. The only interpretation that most Africans have of this verse is having lots of children. And I'm saying that's not all. That's part of it, but that's not all. So we can no longer continue going on just being around around. We need to subdue the earth. We need to say what has God given us as a nation, as a people. And how are we able to harness it and use it for profitability? I mean, in other countries, people are producing uh, fruits and vegetables on their roofs. High tech, high product on the, on the rooftop. And the guys are able to sustain themselves economically on foodstuffs produced on the rooftop. But for us here, you have your large compound, grass, you're always looking for a grass cutter, <laughs> uh, among other things, and you're broke. And you have land that's the size of this room at your house. People in other places, they need only a small section, like from here to there, and their economy is working. That's called subduing. And that's what we are here to do. Ugandans, there is so much money in this country. We need to wake up to that reality, right? And, and change our country and turn our economies around and convert our, our continent, you know. Sometimes when we think about conversion, we only think about getting saved. There, there can be more than one conversion. One, getting saved is one because, you know, then you have the spirit of God and the wisdom to carry out the other conversions. So you convert from being a sinner to being the righteousness of God. Then we convert from sickness to health. Have you ever wondered why people 
who, who pray a lot less than us, live li longer than us, and yet they eat worse food than us. Uh, people are not responding. Maybe I need to come down here and we have a conversation. People live in countries where they eat all that processed meat, whatever, and yet they live longer than us. And yet they pray less than us. And they don't even exercise as much as we do. Conversion. They've learned how to subdue. For us, we need miracles the whole time. Because <laughs> we don't have... <laughs> we haven't subdued the earth. So the only thing we know how to do is pray. And I'm not underestimating prayer. That's what we do here. But I'm just trying to give you a different perspective. What does conversion look like? Is it only from sin to righteousness and nothing else? No. I think it's from sin to righteousness primarily. Sickness to health. Yeah. From bondage to freedom. And more importantly, in regard to business garage, from poverty to wealth. Did you know that's a conversion? Did you know Jesus is involved in that conversion? He says in his primary manifesto, the spirit of the Lord, the first sermon he preached, uh, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to, what? Preach the gospel to the poor. Think about that. Think about that. Th those are the very first words that come out of his mouth. Gospel to the poor. And gospel to the poor, some people think, is getting saved. No. It is economic conversion. Okay. Because think about it. Do the poor need to go to heaven? Definitely. Do the rich people need to go to heaven? Definitely. But in terms of ministry and direct impact, what is it that separates poor people from rich people? It's economics. Economics. And we learned here that the gospel, according to Galatians 3, 8, and 9, is that you shall be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. That's the gospel God preached to Abraham beforehand. It says, and the scripture foreseeing that, that, that God would justify the Gentiles through faith, preached the gospel to Abraham when? Beforehand, saying, open quote. Then he says what the gospel is. In you, all the nations shall be blessed. Close quote. Very, very, very hard to be a blessing when you're broke. Because when you're broke, the only person you're thinking about is who? You. And the money lender. <laughs> the only person you're thinking about is yourself and the money lender. Amen. John sends his disciples to Jesus when he's in prison saying, are you the one or should we expect another because he's distraught? And Jesus uh, gets up and does what he does best, performs miracles. Blind eyes are open. The deaf hear. And all of that. Then he says, okay, go and tell John that the blind, what you've seen, the blind see, mm -hmm. the deaf hear, the lame are walking, the dumb are talking, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised. And what's the last thing he said? The poor have the gospel preached to them. Every one of those scenarios is the opposite of the other. Blindness, seeing. Dumb, speaking. Deaf, hearing. Dead, raised to life. What? Lepers, cleansed. Poor, the gospel. What do you think then the gospel is about? You cannot delineate the gospel from wealth creation because if Jesus himself said those opposites, it can't then be that the poor are going to heaven. Okay, some of you, you see, you've been miseducated for so long, even basic truths in the Bible no longer count. 
There are people who are not willing to let the Bible interrupt their thought life. They say, mm, 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 mm. But like it's right there. Can't you read? It's in English. The poor have the gospel preached. The friends, that's why we are here for business cards. Because this gospel needs to come to life. Jesus is in the business of poverty elimination, not alleviation. <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when Jesus heals, he, he, did you see all those miracles when he healed people? Did he heal somewhere up to a certain level and then like, uh, uh, you have already, I've dealt with diseases X, Y, Z. Go call with the remaining two. I've alleviated the pain, but no. He did a complete job. Everything God does is perfect. So, even when it comes to poverty, where the gospel is the response to poverty, it's about elimination, not just alleviation. And that's why he says the gospel is, you shall be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. How? You're going to be so, when you encounter Jesus, and you understand him and the kingdom of God and how it operates, you're going to be so far removed from poverty, you will become a solution to your communities. Amen. Amen. Think about it. What these people are doing and what Kamara just said. 67%, right? Of all sicknesses being reported to those health center, health centers in the rural are, are respiratory. So people are sick because they are using firewood in those kitchens that don't even have windows. And they smoke. Uh, that's, I grew up in that environment, so I know exactly. And we used to take, uh, we had the rotor for cooking at home. It was my cousin Kenneth, myself, and one other person. My mom was the boss. She didn't cook. <laughs> <laughs> so we knew how to fire up the, the choto and real cook on, on those things. But the smoke, you just come out. <laughs> Just because there's even no window on the car thing, that grass thatched car, car, car kitchen. Am I making sense? And so we treat, 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 and yet the problem is economic. It's not a health problem, it's an economic problem. Oh, come on, people. That's why I'm asking you people who eat worse than us, exercise less than us. Uh, pray less than us, are living longer than us, what's the difference? Economics. Economics. Life expectancy is a factor of economics. Okay, let me repeat that. Life expectancy <laughs> uh, is a function, a function of economics. I'm preaching better than you're listening. Life expectancy is a function of economics. So guys, we must Subdue. We must subdue. We might be few, but we are going to subdue. And this subduing shall not end in word. It will be real. It will be in action. Yeah, one time you sit around a table with people whose revenues, incomes, whatever is in hundreds of millions of dollars. And you will be they are rightfully. Thank you for that one hand clap. I'll go with that as a sign of faith. That the things I'm speaking about are not out of reach for you. But how do you get to hundreds of millions? You start by doing hundreds of millions of shillings. Faithfully. You keep building step by step. Our problem is we want instant breakthrough. When you hear of overnight success, it was a long night. Chris Vallotton said that God takes long to act suddenly. <laughs> when you see sudden breakthroughs, God has been working on them for a long time. Amen. I feel energized. 
Remember, I have three more summons to preach before one o'clock. So this is a summon for. So better give me some energy. I'm going to need it. God takes long to act suddenly. So thank you for being faithful to this. So we are going to. I live to dominate. Okay, something like that. <laughs> Amen. So, that's, we are blessed. This, whoever knows how to move these slides, just help me. It looks like. So, the four stages we looked at are incubation, production, multiplication, and dominion. And we've been looking at the idea of multi, oops, multiplication. And we looked at the seven strategies, and one was the leader's personal growth. There are people here who have testimony about this. Let me uh, tell you leaders. Okay, for example, Kamara here. Uh, Kamara has been my friend for a long time. And both him and I, we always wanted to lose weight. <laughs> at, but different levels of passion about it. Okay? <laughs> Now, Kamara has a coach. I don't yet have a coach. I, I have a coach that I have not yet allowed. <laughs> Kamara, come. <laughs> now, now, you can see that the results are showing. Now, it's not that Kamara has more passion about it than I do. No, he has a coach. I don't. All people who play at a certain level in all fields of endeavor, whether sports, arts, business, life, health, etc., have a coach. Thank you, sir. So, your personal growth sometimes is just dependent on getting a coach or a mentor or getting in a group of peer mentorships to challenge one another. One of the things that has helped me a lot to grow as a church leader, even though I never went to Bible college properly, <laughs> is to get into environments where there are other leaders who are ahead of me in the game and learning from them. I wouldn't be able to do even 10% of what I'm doing now if I didn't do that consistently. It's worth investing in your personal growth. Amen? So the leader's personal growth was one factor. Uh, are you moving it for me or am I moving it? Am I or are you? I need to know. I am. Okay. Delayed action. Then creating clarity. You know, why do we exist? Uh, what do we do? How shall we win? So we looked at that. And people were, are still in the business of creating clarity. Oops. I can confirm that either my finger or this thing is malfunctional. Because I think I skipped a stage, right? Is that the one? Okay, you're in charge, Abraham. Take me to creating clarity and then go to the next slide. Is that the next slide? Okay, next. Branding and awareness. This is Kamara's area of speciality, right? There are all those little things on that screen. They mean something. Brand is value and values. That's the power of your brand is what value? You see, you can just have an image there. Yeah? You just have one image there, and it represents certain values. In other words, how they do business. But it also represents a certain value. You just look at one icon. Yeah? Let me see. Which one should we pick? Starbucks. Okay, who knows which one of those represents how much? Coca-Cola. The Coca-Cola sign there is $175 billion. Just take a picture like this. And it represents that much value. So one time, I want us to be putting up icons of the businesses here. Okay? And when we put together the value, it had better amount to something. Like they throw your, your thing up there. Nomad. Like, 
that represents <coughs> million dollars. Then they throw up chic. Uh, that's X, Y, Z million dollars. Then they throw up those, because your, the problem is we don't yet know your brands. <laughs> visibility plus credibility equals profitability. Friends, you're lacking visibility. I can't find you quickly. Guys, let's be serious about these things. Listen, we're not here just to do business garage and then you know about visibility and then you go back to your old life of just being broke. When God has given you a grand idea of a business, the visibility must show up. Put it in our faces. Let us start identifying you by your business other than your name. Oh, you're the guy from... <laughs> oh, you're the lady from... Because you've just put it out there too much. Paul, what's going on? You are in the visibility business. Impose what yours is. Yes. Capital One Group. I need, I don't need to be, I need, I don't, I shouldn't be asking you. It should be obvious to me that Capital One. <laughs> Mary, Mary Angela is looking at me saying, leave me alone. Do you know that look of leave me alone? But guys, do you, do you get what I'm saying? Eh? People, let me tell you. You're just a few actions away from lots of money. But you know, the problem is that we are comfortable with a little money in our lives. Because you can pay rent or build a house and drive around a car which looks important, we have quit. People don't do great things thinking like that. <sighs> Next slide I need to uh, get done. Product marketing and strategy. Pamela Bayenda was here. And she took it down. Yeah? Remember that? Kamara helped us with the uh, with, uh, visibility issue. Guys, go to Nomad. Give them a hard time. And Capital One. Give them a hard time. Tell them, I want to be in Uganda's faces. What's the budget? Then tell them, I have 5% of that. Now start. <laughs> Do you get what I mean? Yes! Let me tell you, complacency is your worst enemy. This little, little success, eh? you know how they treat, how they do vaccination? They don't want you to catch measles, so they come and give you a little dose of measles. It does not give you measles, but now, Neither, but it also doesn't. It doesn't give you measles, but now, any, any time the real measles comes, whoa, you're inoculated. So some of us, this middle, what do they call it? Middle class lifestyle. Yeah, I have a car, I live in an apartment, is the, is the worst thing that ever happened to us. Why do you think most of those people downtown who are really wealthy are, are not middle class? They didn't go to school. They don't have these certificates we wave around that have a degree. Do you know that's the best thing that ever happened to them? That's why they are wealthy. They are not inoculated. They don't have these useless degree certificates that cause you to think that you have arrived when you're so far. Inoculation. That little money in your life is killing your dreams. <laughs> the little money is killing your dreams. You're there, you can make coca 20 million a month, and you're like, uh uh. People from my village can't even do this so really. <laughs> your 20 million a month has got your head, and you don't know you can be making a billion a month. Yeah. Look, money will be made. Either by you or someone else. So, <laughs> so, if you think you have some good causes, it had better be made by you and not someone else. Whoever makes it will employ it to their own causes. Hmm. 
quiet Presbyterian church right here. <laughs> Took me next, next, and then we looked at next. You're in charge, Abraham. Come on. Click the button. Documented systems and processes. Chris helped us with this, right? You are a system. You are a collection of systems. Your business should be a collection of systems. Otherwise, the man with the key has gone. That's a hassle, not a business. When you have the key to the store, the key to the toilet, the key to the office, the key to the shops, the key to the cars, the key to the... It's all with you on a large... You know those uh, big... You remember those, those who went to boarding schools, there was a... There was that guy, there was always that guy who had the keys to everything around the school. Big bunch of keys. If you're that guy, sorry, you're not ready to take it where we should be going. So documented systems and processes, and then la next, we looked at leadership and teams. I think I talked to it about, about that la next, if not last, last. Governance structures. So this is the part we haven't looked at, but the basic of it is this. If you have no one holding you accountable, if you don't have a team of people holding you accountable for the performance of your own business, you're not going to really grow. Because you're your, you're, you are your own ceiling. So you need a team of people around you who take it to another level, right? Now let's do something that I hoped I wanted us to do. And I think we have a few minutes. Next slide. All right. 2020 outlook. Just take one of those papers they have given you and the pen and try and draw a, a what? A table like this. Or if you have your notebook, you can use your notebook. Even if you have your phone, it's, I don't know if there are ways of drawing the table on a phone. Excel. Yeah. Okay. Do use Excel on your phone. Otherwise, you can use the paper and take a picture. So I asked you guys to give me some of the parameters. Remember, we are talking multiplication, yeah? So even if your business is still a hassle, you are the managing, you are the... You are the you occupy all the C-suit offices by yourself. You're the CEO, you're the CFO, you're the CTO, you're the CMO, you're the COO, you're the CIO, Jene, you are the CO. <laughs> Still, take the courage and write down these things. So, you can write your business, your name, and then your name, the name of your business, and then these six, um, what do we call them? Parameters we are using, and then compare 2019, this is December, where are you now? Where will you be by the end of next year? Where do you want to be? My people perish for lack of knowledge, and people cast off restraint when there is no vision. So let's cast some vision. If today the employees are one, a.k.a. yourself, how many should they be by the end of 2020? The reason we are doing this is we want to help one another. Yeah. Also, be realistic, okay? While you're doing this, a good resource for you to use in some of this thinking is to listen to a podcast called Entry Leadership. It's a free podcast. There are other business podcasts that are really good, but they are for paying for, and then some are too complicated. Entry Leadership is one of the most practical podcasts on business that I know of. So just go and listen to that stuff. I'm telling you, it will work your mind. So number of employees, uh, then clients served in 2019. How many do you want to serve in 2020? New products, services, or programs launched in 2019. How many do you want to launch in? 2020. You may find that your business, the products or services you're offering right now are not helping you break through. If Apple insisted that they were a computer company and they were still producing desktops right now, they would be out of business. 
they wouldn't be where they are. But their curiosity keeps them thinking, what's the, what's the next frontier? So those products or services, you know, Sony should have been where Apple is today or ahead. They got comfortable. They got comfortable. They thought their TVs were special. Now even in the television world, they are ordinary. Sony's biggest breakthrough was the Walkman. Some people here cannot relate. <laughs> but I'm telling you the Walkman put Sony on the market and then they, they, they took leave. And when the, the iPod came, <laughs> they, didn't, they were eaten alive. Kodak, I mean Kodak, they even had the technology for digital photography. And they shelved it. They even had the technology in-house. Now, where is Kodak? Everyone is taking pictures and editing them on their phones. They look like you went to studio. Huh? Those who run studios, I don't know if anyone here runs studios. I know one of our friends, they were a very big business in the studio world. So it's over. You have to keep launching new products or you have to keep innovating even the products you're offering today how do you offer them differently do you know the thing that hasn't yet properly occurred to ugandan businesses is the internet but the day it does it will be because everything is already there we just have refused to adapt but the day it does eh? one day a ugandan will offer a certain way of delivering things and all this commercial space will be useless instantly. Of, I have a shop, I have a shop. You don't need a shop. Hmm? It's happening, but not at a grand scale. We, are, we don't yet have an Amazon type of company. But it's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And it's like, man... Commercial real estate is going to collapse big time once that happens. So innovate. Right now, there are so many ways of doing deliveries. There are people who are doing serious businesses without having to own uh, a shop. But it's only going to get better. So new products or services. Yeah? Locations or outlets for those who must have outlets. How many do you have today? How many do you want to have by the end of the year? Total revenue. Yeah, we cannot be wishy-washy about money and business. Some people want to talk about business without talking about the money. Like, it's like talking about church without talking about souls and salvations and discipleship. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Hmm? It's like talking about marriage without any. Anyway. So, <coughs> cough, cough. <laughs> do, do you get what I mean? Business, money, it's, it's, uh, we shouldn't cringe when people start talking about money and business. Because numbers don't lie. You, you don't have a business if you don't have the numbers. If you don't have the revenue, if you don't have the profit, what was your profit? What is your profit target for 2019? What's your profit target for 2020? Because the problem is most of us do business the way we used to play football in Mwiri Primary School. At this dodge and score, there was a what? There was a goal. <laughs> it was a very bad way to play because everyone is playing for themselves. There is no teamwork. <laughs> But there are even no goalposts. So, like, so what do you want your net profit to be in 2020? It's like, no, we will see when we get there. No, you will not see. <laughs> 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 
If you don't see now, you will not see then. Makes sense. So let, let, let's. So that's what I wanted us to engage with. So do you have your numbers? Have you written them down? Please write, 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 write. Write them down. What's happening here? Are we writing or not? Or are we are saying, mm -hmm. look, you don't have to be the business owner. This might be the value you take to the business owner next week and say, now, boss, we've been going around in circles. Can we set some targets for 2020? <laughs> They'll be like, eh. <laughs> this one is the... Uh, they, they will figure out a position for you in the, in the company. You become the manager special projects, something like that. You know when they create a, because you're bringing some incredible thought that wasn't there before. So please, the other, this is the other thing I want to advocate. For those of you who are not yet running your own businesses, or you run your, your hustle, but you're still employed in another business, Take these same things to your employer. The Bible is very clear. If you're not faithful in another man's thing, who will give you your own? Take this thing to your employer. Help your employer succeed. And when it's your turn, you will have lots of people trying to help you succeed because you reap what you sow. When you get brilliant ideas, don't hide. This is what people do. They're employed somewhere, they get brilliant ideas, they keep writing them in a book, hiding them that the day I start my own business, this is what I'm going to do. That's not very useful. You get a great idea, introduce it to your company where you work right now. Let them be the ones to reject it. But when you've brought it on, 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 on what? On board. And then God will, not, will just overwhelm you with ideas. Wow, awesome, yeah? So, I don't know where we go from here now that we have those numbers. You may need to identify someone that you trust and have coffee in the next two weeks and look at those numbers. Yeah, by the, I hope everyone is on the WhatsApp group for Business Garage. Yeah, have coffee with someone you trust and say, you know, I just want you to look through what I wrote down at Business Garage. And then let them ask you some tough questions about those numbers. How are you actually going to make it happen? I'm telling you, great things are about to happen here, right? So, bless you so much. Thank you. Over to you, 